What does the modern camper look like? It's the 10th anniversary of the annual North American Camping Report, and they've got some details about what the makeup of the modern camper is. Plus our visit to the Outer Banks and Cape Hatteras. This is RV Miles. Welcome to episode number 330 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two RVers who, along with our three boys, Jack, Ethan, and Henry, have been crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip since 2016. Here at RV Miles, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from industry news to travel destinations, our national parks, and so much more. Our good friend uh, James in in the uh, RV Miles community pointed out uh, recently that we just crossed the seven-year mark. Of the RV Miles podcast. We did. Um, so happy birthday, RV Miles podcast. Happy birthday, RV Miles podcast. I really appreciate that James was paying attention to that for us because we are really unorganized and we probably should have said it on the last episode as yeah. well because time is a little funny for us at the moment. We are recording this ahead of time. If you're watching... That's rare. <laughs> <laughs> so very rare. rare, so rare. So we're very confused. What day is it? Where are we? We don't know. But if you are watching this, you are watching what will be the last episode for a while from the campground. By the time you see us again, we will be back in the Mile Zero studio. We will be back in an air-conditioned, sound-controlled environment. <laughs> <laughs> we were we are going to take one week off, so the podcast will be yes. uh, out of service for, for a week, but we will be back very shortly. But you won't be without something, because while we are away, we are going to share a past Detour episode for those of you that are not Mile Marker members and hear us talk about Detour all the time, and you wonder, well, what is that all about? And is it even anything I would be interested in? Well, while we're off on a little vacation with our family, we're going to drop one of those detour episodes on the channel as well as in your podcast feed and you can take a listen for yourself and maybe come and join us on future detour episodes. So look for that in the next uh, week. That'll be next week's episode. And then we will be back with you live to recap the last little bits of our summer RV trip. We are coming to you again from the Savannah Lakes RV Resort, just outside of Savannah, Georgia. I wanted to say South Carolina. I don't well, know. Well, we're in South Carolina. We are in South Carolina. We are in South Carolina. We're in Hardyville, yeah. South Carolina but we are only about 15 miles from Savannah. Hopefully we will make it in there tonight, but you never know. Again, there's so much extra we're trying to do, which is something we don't normally do. A lot of times our, our work is so very much dependent on what happened that week that trying to do this little bit of extra has us just all, it just has us all befuddled. Around this, here. This might be the cleanest picnic table we have ever sat at. I think only our viewers truly understand the joy of a good picnic table. Yeah. I, man, you could eat off this thing. It's so clean. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We wanted to kick the episode off today with uh, the the 10th anniversary. We've been talking about this here and there on the podcast and on the uh, RV Miles news videos of the KOA annual North American camping report. Now, I always have to say when we talk about this report is that it is sponsored by a KOA. It is, uh, a, it is a national survey done by a third party organization. It is not of KOA customers. It is of the general camping public. So uh, this year, because it's the 10th anniversary of the report, they've decided to put 10 mini reports out. And uh, we've shared a couple of those with you, but this one is about the makeup of the average camper right now, um, and I and the not average, you know, the uh, the the smaller groups of campers, the camper profile report is what they call it. And there's a lot of stuff in here, and we'll share uh, the whole report in the description for this episode. They have lots of great graphics and stuff, and you can you can dive into all this stuff if you're interested. Uh, but we just wanted to to pop off of a few of the main points of this report here. Uh, first of all, the average camper. Many campers begin their outdoor experience before the age of 18, 60%, fostering a lifelong love for nature. Typically, they embark on one to two camping trips per year, 65%, spending an average of 6.7 nights camping annually. Is that more than you thought it would be? Um, 
No, I actually think it's less than. If it's you're more than I about, thought it would. If be. you're talking about the nights spent camping, yeah. were you? Are you? No, and the- I'm talking about the to- to the amount, the amount of people that have gone camping before they were 18. Oh, I, I think that's that's higher than I thought. But yeah, I would say the the nights camped is about about what I would expect. It's not. I'm not surprised by it. I'm one of those numbers. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you were. Yeah, I, but for sure. I'm one of those numbers, and I I can see the correlation between the experiences I had going RVing, or we were tent camping. My grandparents had the RV, but I, we were sleeping in the tent, and the tent camping. The backpacking in the backcountry of Rocky Mountain National Park that I did several times as a teenager, the just sort of love for the outdoors in a peripheral way, like how special they were to leave Kansas City and be in these beautiful spaces like the Buffalo National River or the Rocky Mountain National Park. I can see how that influenced us to do that as tent campers with our own children and then how that eventually just the stepping stones of when we were presented with becoming full-time RVers when that became a reality. I think there's such a, uh, it's such a low bar to, to tent camp. I think a lot of, I mean, just in terms of like, (laughs) well, it's, it's an affordable way to do it. The bar is the, the, (laughs) the entry, the, the bar to entry is, is is low. And, and I, so I think it's a lot of, it's something that a lot of people try, even if they don't end up loving it, even if a whole family does it and that family never does it again, maybe one of those people, you know, they, it sparked something for them. I, I know I've told this story before, but um, my, I think my first memory was waking up. The, the first thing that I remember really young um, was waking up. I don't know. My parents divorced when I was like uh, five or something like that. And so I don't have a lot of memories of, of my parents together. Right. Yeah. And uh, so one of those memories is uh, we drove to St. Louis. Uh, we did lots of trips to St. Louis when I was a kid, uh, and we were going camping. And I just remember waking up from my car seat in the back seat. It was night, and looking out the front window and seeing, uh, you know, the headlights on. Mm-hmm. And my parents very frustrated trying to put a tent together at night. I love how you said very <laughs> frustrated. That's, that's such a that, that's the word I'll use. Such yeah. a PC way of saying it. <laughs> um, you know, I when you talk about if one family member, you know, maybe not all the family, but at least one family member, and I have to say, I am that one family member. You know, the yeah. rest of my family, they're not big campers. I for my mom. The camping experiences that were really magical for me as a kid were probably absolutely awful. That's probably for true for a lot of parents, particularly a lot of moms. Yes. Uh, I where mean, the kids are having a great time, but the parents are doing everything to make that a great yeah, time. I mean, yeah. we were camping at, at Buffalo, Nash, you know, Buffalo National River. It's in, you know... Arkansas up there in the Ozarks in July. I don't think it was very, you know, it was probably incredibly hot and humid. I know it was. You got the cooler full of water and the eggs are like the egg carton soaking. And And I have a very (laughs) distinct memory of a, I don't remember the storm. I don't remember how all of this happened. But I do remember my mother being very frustrated that everything in our tent was soaked. (laughs) <laughs> everything was wet and she had to spend her whole day it was her and a couple of my aunts had to spend the whole day at a laundromat washing everything which having been there now as an adult to that area and camped at that campground it is the laundromat is not close <laughs> no and i imagine in the 80s and early 90s uh that that was incredibly frustrating. Yeah, especially Even more you don't know so. where it is and stuff. You're not looking it up yeah, on your phone. I didn't have Siri to be like, take a left, <laughs> go two miles. So I have memories like that. I have, you know, I used to really associate camping with family. That that was such a core memory for me. Um, and now, you know, it's certainly shifted a lot over the years. To me, it's become more about community in general and not just, you know, your inner family circle. And so, yeah, I, 
I can see why maybe my mom is more like, give me a camp, you know, give me a cabin all day, every day. Because, uh, when I came into this as an, as a parent, uh, I came into it with an RV that had air conditioning and at least, well, you know, we, we did do a, a couple, we did say, do a but, couple, we did do a, a few tent camping trips. Yeah, but we didn't do them in July in Arkansas. The, that's so. true. We no. instead <laughs> we, we did, did them in, my... <laughs> in, in early March in the Smokies uh, and froze our butts off. We did. Oh gosh. I remember waking up a th- <laughs> thousand times on that first camping trip uh, probably every 20 minutes to make sure that the boys you, were warm you spent I was years so... you spent years waking up to make sure that the boys are not warm or no, cold they were babies and i was always like they will wake up if they're but too they, warm or cold. they would not they would just toss and turn and not get good sleep and then when babies don't get good sleep boy watch out next day is rough so, all right let, let's let's move on though in the report here the new camper as opposed to the average camper we know there's been a lot of new campers as of late compared to the average camper new campers are made of a more diverse population camping is getting more and more diverse and that's great with 52 percent though being from gen x and boomer generations and wow they remembered they remembered our generation i don't know how i feel about that i don't know i like to stay off their radar okay and 54 percent of campers frequently begin their outdoor stays at a campground or outdoor resort with abundant services and amenities with 48 percent considering wi-fi the most important amenity at a campground so people uh, are more and more interested in amenities, even though, you know, I think a lot of us in, you know, in the Facebook groups and in the comments of things were like, you know, talking about how camping is getting back to nature and getting away from it all and stuff. A lot of people are wanting those amenities. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's room for everything, right? We can have, we can have lots of different things, right? We can have both. Uh, we can have both at different, we can like both. That's us. Uh-huh. You know, we love getting out in the middle of nowhere. We love doing a lot of boondocking. We love coming to a place like this where there's a pool and a clubhouse and the sites are made of concrete and they're 100% perfectly flat. You know, <sighs> there, there, there is just a lot of joy uh, in all of it for us. And I, I don't think we are, are people who have to be one thing. No, but, you know, I have to say I just remembered uh, when we decided to do that Smoky Mountain trip, that was our first big, long, week-long mm-hmm. tent camping trip, with all three of the kids. We sought out a campground that had amenities, playground, yeah. washer, dryer, you know, all of that, to tent camp. And it's... It occurred to me that probably the reason why we sought that out and not something a little bit more rustic is we had actually done two very rustic trips prior to that. One time when it was just Jack and we went up to Michigan in the summer. The other time when it was Jack and Ethan and they were little, little, and we went to Starved Rock. And both of those times we're friggin' miserable. <laughs> they, yeah, they were they were a little rough. They, they were, were a little, little rough. We did the summer tent camping thing with small people, and we were like, never again. Uh, and then we did the state park in Michigan. That was just not great <laughs> on so many different levels. The the not having anything to do with nature. It wasn't a state park. It was it that was a or private was a park. Private it was a party park. Oh, it was a party park. It, it was, was a party park. It, you uh, know, which is not great when yeah. you have like your yeah. you know, twenty two month old You know, and what uh, I mean by that is like the lake and, and bush lights and and yeah, Tonganoxy, let's it, go. It, lot, I don't mean a place with a lot of amenities. I mean a place where it's like we're a party park. We're, we're it was a party park. Slip and slides and stuff like that. Yeah. So I can see now why when we decided to do a long tent camping trip, we were like, "No, we're we're gonna we're gonna need like." It, that was also a serious things. vacation where these other two trips were fairly close to home. They were, and if they we were like disasters, this? we could go back yeah. home. Right. Yeah. This was a vacation driving. You know, a. Uh, more than a day's drive away and required us to have plans so that it it wasn't a disaster. Yeah. You know? So I, I can see how for some, you just need to test it out, but you need some things that still feel familiar. You, yeah. you know, things that remind you of home to decide if you like this. And then, you know, I know some people like to go the complete opposite and they're like, just toss me into the back country and I'll figure it all out. 
Some people are like, I want to ease into this. And resorts like we're at here at Savannah Lake and others across the country are really great gateways into this lifestyle to even know if you like it or not. And that's, again, I, you know, I don't think it's reflected in this particular report we're talking about, but I'd also love to know from that new camper perspective, how many people are renting an RV, like going to somewhere like an RV share and bringing it here to like Savannah Lakes just to test out without making that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollar investment in something they don't even know if they like. Yeah, I, I would imagine it's a big swath of Yeah, I campers. hope so. I think that that's the best way to decide. If you don't have someone you can borrow a rig from, but you're not really fully sure this is for you, then you should rent from somewhere like an RV share and just try it out for a couple of nights and, and see what you think. We'll share this full report in the description so you can check it out as well. There's also a lot of more information in there that I think is really eye-opening. All right, chances are you've seen them on the road. That's because Blue Ox designs and manufactures the best towing products in the industry. Just look around. You'll find them on highways and campgrounds and anywhere you find people traveling in the great outdoors. From award-winning tow bars and base plates to a full line of weight-distributing hitches, adjustable ball mounts, and now they have fifth-wheel hitches Two. With Blue Ox, towing doesn't have to be a drag. Visit BlueOx.com for more information. Harvest Host is a membership that allows RVers to take a rest from the road and enjoy unlimited overnight stays at over 5,100 unique locations in North America, such as breweries, farms, attractions, wineries, and much more. Easily plan and book your next RV trip and enjoy over $1,500 in exclusive member benefits by joining Harvest Hosts. Get 15% off your first year of membership with the code MILES, M-I-L-E-S. Just go to HarvestHosts.com to become a Harvest Hosts member today. All right, it's time to talk about our visit to Cape Hatteras National Seashore and the Outer Banks of North Carolina. This was an interesting place that we had never been before. I loved it. I, you know, if you watched or listened to episode 328, we were recording that from our campground there. And I think that just the joy of being back in a national park campground, I know we expressed that several times on that episode. And that is that is home for us yeah. that when you roll into a national park campground there is just it is like just butterflies in my stomach i know that we are just in this incredibly special place i feel that way too about army corps of engineer campgrounds cuz i know i'm about to get like a huge site that i paid like 10 dollars for i love a national park campground. And this one was just really great access to a lot of the different national park sites that are sort of clustered together in this area. And it was good access into town as well. Uh, but I just, I, I really, I really enjoyed it more there than I thought I would. I don't know about you, but yeah. I had such a great week. Well, there. So we stayed at the Oregon Inlet Campground uh, in Cape Hatteras National Seashore, and it is it was hot, right? Uh, this is the so time of hot. year it's hot, but we were right on the ocean, so you have the ability to walk over to the ocean. You're not like like your campsite's not on the ocean, but you you know a ten minute walk over yeah, over to the ocean through up the over the dunes down into the beach so so you can get into water and you can you can cool off plus we had electricity and and water hookup um and there's a dump station on site but so we did have the ability to run the air conditioner which was important this time of year but this is yeah it's a great uh it's a great national park campground you know i was thinking though you know people are always like i don't go to private campgrounds because they cram everybody in together like the sites there were pretty close they were very close. i mean they're, but you still had a lot of room but they're no, i mean it's no different than this yeah right? I, I mean you know i shared a reel of where we were at you can find it it's on instagram but it, i also shared it as a short on the youtube channel and it it showed and one person's comment was like oh they really pack you in there and i was just which cracked me up because as as it pans the end of that reel is just this big open green space <laughs> I mean, I think what but people like, want is like well, an entire acre to themselves I know, and they're never going to get never, it, right? Yeah they, yeah, they want to roll into that campground and be the only person in that campground. That's just not going to happen. I, you know, at the same time, the vibe in a national park campground is one of those that really gives me like 
the idea of what RVing and camping is. There's just a, amongst everyone that is there, we're all hot, we're all sandy, you know, kids are, are running around on, you know, playing outside, riding their bikes, folks are just hanging out, we're all sweating, we all know that it's summer and it's hot, but these are like vacations. We're here in yeah. this beautiful national park with this gorgeous shoreline, just a few minutes walk from our campsite and all of these incredible national park sites that we can go and visit. And you just feel, it's just so calm. I love a national park campground. It was a uh, decent, decent bathhouses uh, for the, for the, toilet part uh the the <laughs> Shower. showers were outside of the bathhouse and they were it was like you know like in south pacific where they like you pull the ring and the water drops down on your head like i'm yes. gonna wash that man right out of my hair wow yeah because that, so many people watching this right now listening Trust to this me, right now our audience is the, is 50 65 and older they know what i'm talking uh, about the deep cut <laughs> south pacific and i knew immediately where you were going but i bet a lot of people are like the south pacific i have no jason but i it, don't know please great for a quick rinse of the sand off of you uh well, dark a, and gloomy inside them but, but clean shower. enough clean, you know clean up that i felt fine with them uh wearing some sandals and uh was able to shower but Henry's, not the best of of shower experiences henry loved it he said it was one of the best times he's had taking a shower because you just pull it, it, the it's rain. hot and a lot of water it's, yes. it's not like there we've definitely had worse like you know the, those hard sprays that are cold and yeah there's 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 definitely uh, a lot to be said yeah. about a big dump of warm water <laughs> yes so the bathhouses aren't spectacular they're not awful you're gonna be able to get clean if you don't want to use you know if you don't have the tank space like we did you but know. if you're if you're somebody that doesn't have a a a toilet or your, or your pop-up camper, something mm -hmm. like that, tent camper, that, that you'd be totally comfortable using the bathhouses for uh, those necessities here. Yeah. And we should say one more thing about this campground and then we'll move on. But um, there are three loops total. Not every loop has electricity. Yeah. So there is half of our section uh, that we were in. And this is one of the reasons why we were on a waiting list to get in. And I had an um, notification going for this campground is because I only wanted to do electric. I was not messing around with the heat. And so there is a whole section, if not more, of this campground where there is no electric. And as it tends to go, those sites are the best sites. You know, they're they the closest to the ocean. Beautiful. They're back in the dunes, all that sort of stuff. They, yeah. they are the best sites. Beautiful. Uh, and they were packed. Yeah. Every everyone was there. They do allow generators at particular times of day, uh, but really only if you need to just top some things off. I will say I didn't hear generators here. No, once you I I walked the loop several times. Like if I went up to the bathhouse, I'd take the long way back just to you know get in my steps. And certainly as you get closer, I I think it's very windy there. So that's another thing. It's very hard to have awnings out because it's very, very windy. Yeah. You're just You're right the ocean. there. You're yeah. on the ocean. I think that that helps uh, damper the sound of the generators. I think the wind really makes a big difference there. But if you got close to someone's rig, you knew they were running a generator, but you'd walk a couple rigs down and that sound would be totally gone. So... All right, there's a lot to do in this area. We yeah. didn't even do a tenth of it, but let's dive into some of the stuff we did. The first thing we did was we took a drive down to the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. So this is a good 45 minute drive uh, down the down the seaway, but uh, over these, you know, the the bridges that feel like they're inches above <laughs> the water and go on for a couple miles. Um, it was just a gorgeous drive along the seashore uh, to get down to the uh, the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. This lighthouse is under construction right now, uh, so we didn't get to see much of it, but we got to go to the museum and, and learn about its history. It's a really cool story because they actually moved this lighthouse. If you know anything about barrier islands, um, you might know that they move over time. Um, the what happens is they're basically, you know, sand, right? Uh, and the sand from one side moves to the other side, and those islands over time move inwards, and when this Lighthouse was first built. It was built too close to the water, and eventually they had to move it. So there's videos of of how they 
moved to Lighthouse, which is just wild to me. Um, it, it, but it was a it was a cool experience, even though it was under construction and you couldn't go up in it. I really enjoyed it there. This is one of three lighthouses that are a part of Cape Hatteras National Seashore. We made it to two out of the three. This lighthouse, uh, along with the other one that we visited, you can go up inside. You can get tickets to. Obviously, this is under refurbishment right now, so you can't. But once this opens back up, if that's something you're interested in, I do believe it's 700 steps that you can take up to the top and get some beautiful views of the island. The other one we went to was the Body Lighthouse on Body. The island right down from the campground. It's spelled like Bodie, but I think it's, it's body. It's body. Yeah. When the ranger um, said it to me, I thought, is he wrong? And then I was like, <laughs> B O D I E. No, it's not so wrong. This one was open and available to go up in, but you did have to get tickets. We didn't, we didn't do it. We didn't have, we had a lot to do, right? There's a lot, like I said, we did, we touched maybe a tenth of what to do. We didn't, so we just went there to visit it take a look at it and go to the gift shop and stuff like that but this is one that is open and available for you to go up in it it does have a weight limit this is the other reason we didn't go up in it is that i'm like right, right on the edge of that weight limit <laughs> and uh each you know it's 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 big spiral staircases going all to the top of all of these we've been in uh once before and uh they're they're a little nerve-wracking for the younger generation and of Epperson's. Of Epperson's. And what you have to do in this one is go one at a time. Like, you can't hold a kid's hand. So keep that in mind. Yeah, and I think that goes for when people are coming up and people are coming down. You have to yeah. share the space. So it's still beautiful. They have a, a really nice museum there at this lighthouse that you should. And I'm not going to say its name because I keep wanting to say the rock. Body. Body. Not body. Body. They have a really great museum there as well to learn a little bit about uh, the lighthouse keepers and the history of the area. So it's definitely worth both of these lights, lighthouses, all of the lighthouses are worth a stop, even if you don't plan to go into them. Don't skip it just because you're not going to do what is considered the main attraction. There's so much more there and there's so much to learn, even if you're not going to go up to the top of the lighthouse. The next thing we did is a, is a big thing to do in this area, of course, and that's to visit the Wright Brothers National Monument uh, at Kitty Hawk on Kill Devil Hill. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, which is interesting because nobody actually knows the true story of why it's named that. They're there are a couple competing main theories. Anyway, uh, the Wright brothers, of course, uh, were the first ones to conquer powered flight. Uh, and this is the place where they did it. So there are a few different Wright brothers stops uh, in the National Park Service. There's their bicycle shop in Dayton, Ohio. But this is where they actually uh, flew the plane for the first time. They have a replica of the plane here, the real ones in the Smithsonian. Uh, they have some parts from the real plane here. But what you're really getting here is a history of the Wright brothers a bit, uh, a reconstruction of of sort of where they stayed in the in the um, the hangar that they built. Uh, but you're walking along the flight path where the first powered flight took place. And that is kind of a really amazing experience yeah. to be like this. This is where it happened. And to know and how also, quickly after that happened, the world just rapidly changed. And also they didn't go very far. No, no. Well, they it's funny because really like the didn't. first three they have. So they have markers. They have a marker of where they took off. And you can walk a path right along this, these markers. They have marker where they took off and then markers for the first three flights, with, which were all less than 200 feet. Yeah. And then the fourth flight went 800 feet and they were like, OK, we got it. <laughs> we can leave now. Yeah. We've done it. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a cool experience. Uh, you could you could do this in a very short amount of time or you could spend a half day here. Uh, it's kind of up to you, depending on how far you want to walk, if you want to uh, walk to the to the the monument to them and all that sort of stuff. Um, if you want to uh, uh, see all the exhibits in, in the visitor center, which is a cool, actually it's one of those mission 66 visitor centers that were, were built back in, in the sixties um, for the national park service. And it kind of has a, its own little unique vibe. I really liked it, but it's, it's really close to town. It's not a far drive or anything like that. So uh, it's, it's a great visit uh, and it is a paid national park service site. So if you've got a pass, you can get in. Otherwise, you're going to have to pay, I think, $10 a person here. We did a junior ranger program here, which I thought was really exceptional. We did this with Henry. You can become a junior flight ranger, which is very cute. This is the park, I think, that I would advocate for spending a little bit more time. Actually, the 
this one and the next one we're going to talk about um, can easily be half days. And so just kind of keep that in mind when you get there, because especially if you're going to have a kid that wants to do the junior ranger program, that is going to take a little bit of time. And there's a decent amount of walking that goes with that. Like just even their monument, which is up on the hill, is a considerable distance. I do believe you can drive over there. But if you want to walk it, it is a considerable distance from the visitor center in addition to the flight path that you're going to walk as well. So in the summertime, that's a lot of walking in, in extreme heat. So just kind of keep some of those things in yeah. mind, depending on what time of year you're visiting. But it is right off the main drag. So if you're if you're camping, like if you're driving through and you're camping like two hours away and you want to just do a quick stop, they have decent RV parking if it's not taken up by other uh, cars. Uh, and <laughs> uh, and you could, you know, you could step in and spend an hour here if that's all you have the ability to do. So don't skip it. It's worth going to whether you've got the time to spend the whole half day or not. Okay, our next visit is still pretty close to the Oregon Inlet campground. Uh, we headed over to Roanoke Island. And over on Roanoke Island, you can visit Fort Raleigh National Historical Site. And uh, if you don't know much about Fort Raleigh, it's a really interesting story. And we did an episode of the America's National Parks podcast we'll link to on this uh, about the lost colony of Roanoke. It was uh, it was a colony of settlers um, that were sort of left behind here. I'm not going to tell the whole story. Uh, and when supply came back from England a couple years later, they had disappeared. Uh, and there's there's a whole lot involved with this, uh, with Sir Walter Raleigh and stuff. But this is, um, th this is not a very big site in terms of like the historic part of it. You there is the star shaped fort that is in the ground that you can walk up to and and see, but it's an excellent visitor center, and the ranger program that they do here uh, regularly throughout the day is well worth it. So we spent about an hour with the ranger and he led us through the whole story. Yeah. So this is called the Lost Colony Walking Tour. This is my favorite stop of everything that we did on this day. We hit up three different sites in one day. This was my favorite stop. Obviously, it's super old timey history. I absolutely find that so fascinating. And I think if you don't know anything about the lost colony of Roanoke or what led up to, and I think that's more of it, the what led up to the lost colony, it's incredibly fascinating. Like the hit and and fascinating and infuriating yeah. at the same time. All of that. Incredibly yeah. infuriating the way Europeans behaved when they came over here. I loved this. Our ranger was fantastic, very informative, and who's a volunteer too, which I, uh, oh, again, this, uh, like, if I can't get a job at Monticello, maybe I can come over here and get a job at Fort Raleigh. So informative, so willing to stay and answer questions. And if it helps, like if you think, oh, you know, this must be just, you know, my kids aren't going to enjoy this. Our kids were fascinated. They said not one time did someone ask me, is this almost over? They were engaged. Yeah. They were, they asked questions. Yeah. They were, they helped the ranger, like do the pro. He was so good at involving the young people, but I thought, the sign of a truly good ranger program is if it has the power to keep the young, every age group like involved. And of course, this is a truly fascinating story. You really should go listen to that America's National Parks podcast episode because it is so fascinating. Yeah. And they found new information, though, since we did that podcast. Yeah, so we so have to redo like, it. <laughs> we have to redo it because there's now new information. They're pretty sure they actually know what happened to the last colony, but I'm not going to give it away. They at you least need... have a couple ideas. Yeah. Like so solid ideas. Like there, there are four ways you can learn the story of the, the lost colony of Roanoke. One is you can listen to our episode of the National Parks podcast. You can listen to it before you go. You can listen to it when you're walking around there. You can go to see the film at the visitor center, which is also outdated uh, when it comes to some of these mm -hmm. new things. It's like 30 years old or something like that. Uh, you can go on the ranger led tour or you can go to the show. <laughs> go to the show. <laughs> the, the lost colony so we didn't get to do this we because it got canceled got can because of rain. First time all summer they'd had to cancel it was when we were going to go. But they have here on site, and you can walk around this if you're not going to it, uh, 
during your visit, they have a gorgeous outdoor amphitheater that looks right over the water and comfortable seats and everything like that. And the show happens at sunset. And this is a show that has been around. I, I don't remember what the opening date was. But 1937. It, was, it, it, it predates the musical Oklahoma, which is considered the first real American musical. If you don't know him, we're going to get into a little yeah, buckle theater, up. theater nerdiness here. Buckle up, everybody. We're uh, putting our degrees to use. Musicals are considered like the truly American art form. Uh, even though, you know, we, we kind of stole them from operettas a little bit from Gilbert and Sullivan. Stop, so. no. The, but <laughs> but mu- but a musical where there's 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 dialogue and there's dance and there's music and all that uh, didn't truly exist until Oklahoma. And this show predates Oklahoma, but has a lot of those elements. In many ways, it was a precursor to Oklahoma it has been running there forever minus you know some pandemic time and stuff like that and it has a storied history of they 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 have this idea at the very beginning to put professional actors with local amateurs and that's the way it's always been done and the 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 lineage of people who have performed in the show include people like Andy Griffith Lynn Redgrave it, it, it's I- Incredible the history this show has. And it's been performing there forever. And it's a big, beautiful, gorgeous amphitheater. And uh, I, I think you should really consider trying to check it out because it's very popular. I really wish we had been able to go so we could talk a little bit more about it. I know. But we're going to have to go back to the area now specifically yeah. for this. I, for us, as you know, my degree is in musical theater. So for me to be standing somewhere where really, and there were a lot of shows before Oklahoma, I Irving Berlin, Cole Porter, they were all doing their things, but really. They just weren't considered the American the musical. The American musical. The yeah. true American musical, Rodgers and Hammerstein. To stand in a space that was about 10 years ahead of that. I think Oklahoma premiered in like 1948. No, it was it was closer to that. Uh, was it 44? Now it, we got to look it up. Because Walter and I looked. Future Us. We just looked it up. It's actually March 1943. So my second guess was a little bit closer than my <laughs> so first. So six years apart. So six years apart. But to already know that that, you know, again, I think it speaks to like the seeds of that were already there. It's just R&H took it and, and finally kind of put it all yeah. together into one place. To have that kind of history that actually a lot of, like, I wasn't taught about, I did not learn about this show in school. Yeah. And it's the longest running show in, yeah. in the U.S. You talked to a friend of ours, a yeah. theater friend of ours. You two were texting back and forth, and he didn't know yeah. Yeah. about and, it, I mean, which is if we yeah. can find something he doesn't know, yeah. we just won the lottery. So. Yeah. Uh, this is a, this is a really cool piece of theater history that I don't think a lot of people know about. I can't speak to the quality of it. I didn't see it, but just the history part of it is enough for me to to say you should go if you are interested in theater history and or not. Yeah, yeah. On on the, on the site is also the uh, the Freedmen's Colony that was established for former slaves after the battle after the Battle of Roanoke in 1862. Um, there's there's lots more history that goes beyond the lost colony here. There's of course the Native American history, and that's yes. a, that's a big part of it. Um, and uh, it's it's just a wonderful stop. Fort Rally is is well worth your your time. Yeah, and there's a question that the We'll move on from this in a second, but I just want to point out the fact that the National Park Service really does a good job of making sure that we understand that this is not a European story exclusively. And the ranger asked such a fascinating question at the end of this program that really stuck with me for a long time. And I don't want to give the question away because I think you need to be able to form your own opinion like in that moment or start to form your own opinion in that moment. But they asked a question after telling us the story that I think left a lot of us sort of uh, sort of stopped at our tracks a bit and really made us consider the whole picture. 
So again, kudos to the National Park uh, for really putting together programs that uh, aren't just one-sided programs. They're, they're very, very good about telling the whole story. Not the story you know, the whole story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we did eat at a couple places here that we want to just mention quickly. Uh, the Daredevil Pizza uh, was some, some decent counter service pizza. Uh, Not far from Kitty Hawk or from the yeah. Wright Brothers, about two miles from there. So easy to pop over after visiting. And there's a brand new uh, building right across the road from the Oregon Inlet Campground. You could walk over there if you wanted to, um, where the marina is. And inside it is a is sort of like a half counter service, half table service, really super casual uh, restaurant that we ate at called Sea Chef. They also have a, a shop in there um, where you can get fishing and outdoor gear and stuff like that. Um, so it's Sea Chef at the Oregon Inlet Fishing Center. And we just sort of had appetizers and dessert here. And it was wonderful. I had some of the best tuna salad I've ever had, like fresh caught tuna a salad with like literally, uh, you know, in a plastic tub with saltine crackers. Phenomenal. Uh, and, and, and the, but the big, the big draw here was the desserts. The desserts were the main reason why I wanted to go there. When I looked at the menu, you had a phenomenal bread pudding. Uh, no, I had, no, no, sorry. I had uh, banana pudding, banana which is, pudding. you know, a, it's a, a Southern staple, As right? A whole, yeah. I, I, will, I, I do have a little bone to pick here uh -oh. with, with banana pudding wherever I've had it at places like this. You're not about to come for Nilla wafers, are you? I I am about to come for the way they use Nilla wafers. Oh, how dare you? No, no, no. I love Nilla wafers. Yeah. The problem is they prepackage these banana puddings and put the Nilla wafers in them. Yeah, they have to soften up. No, they we yes. they, I want some crunch. They I, can just, do that I on top. Know, I want it fresh. Well, they didn't. And they don't anytime I ever get one of these. Well, I don't I know want what to tell you. I need to get it at like a fancy restaurant or something. But this isn't a fancy <laughs> restaurant dessert. No, you shouldn't get it at this a fancy is, restaurant. Again, that's in probably a plastic the problem. cup with a lid that you pull off. That's the thing, right? So it was it was still very good. But you had this weird dessert. I was not weird. Had, it was what, amazing. But it was weird when you read it because it had a saltine cracker crust. Yes. It was essentially it was like a lemon pie. Yeah. And it had uh, a saltine cracker crust, which I was, it was something I didn't know I needed in my life. And I've always needed in my life because that saltine cracker crust with that kind of lemony, sweet, sour, tart, kind of custardy lemon, and then a little bit of whipped cream on top. And it had like a little mint leaf. It was, and then it, it had also this, um, I believe it was like a raspberry coolie kind of that you, you poured over it. Oh, just uh, give me that all day, every day. It was so good. It one of the best desserts I have ever had on the road. That is saying something. But <laughs> I, I got to tell you, if you just go for dessert, I I actually really enjoyed their um, clam based soup. I can't remember the exact name of it. It was a cream base. It wasn't a chowder. Um, that was delicious as well. But if you only have a few minutes, you only want to go for one little thing, go for the dessert. Oh, it was so good. <laughs> All right. That was our visit to the Outer Banks. We'd love to know where you've gone in the Outer Banks, where we should go when we head back next time, because we will go again, hopefully not when it is as hot as it was. No, 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 no. Let's try for some cooler weather next time. <laughs> The RV lifestyle is about community, and the RV community is at the heart of RV life. RV life recently celebrated the one millionth trip planned with RV life trip wizard, their excellent trip planning tool for RVers, featuring all the trusted reviews, pictures, and tips from their RV life campground site. RV life also features several blog sites and over 20 additional RVing forums to serve the RV community. All this experience and community feedback come together to create a fantastic trip planner and mobile navigation tool collectively called RV Life Pro. RV Life has marked a milestone of over 3 billion miles traveled using RV Life Pro, counting both the planned RV trips and ad hoc navigation with the included RV Safe mobile app. Take 25% off RV Life Pro at the link in the description for this episode. RV Miles is sponsored by RVPostings.com, your go-to platform for buying and selling RVs. Explore a wide range of RVs from small pop-up campers to large 
diesel pushers find the perfect fit for your travel needs. With their user-friendly interface, you can easily navigate through their website for a seamless RV shopping experience. You can get comprehensive information about each RV, including photos, features, details, and pricing, and connect with sellers directly. No middlemen. And if you're selling your RV, you can list it on RVPostings.com and reach a targeted audience of RV buyers, ditching the tire kickers and the repetitive, is this still available messages. It's a paid but affordable platform for sellers to post RVs for sale, so buyers can be sure that the seller is real and serious about selling. Whether you're buying or selling, RVPostings.com connects RV enthusiasts across the country. Get eyes on your RV with their Facebook buy and sell group with 163 thousand members all rvs posted on their website are posted to the group as well as other sites like oodle class and american listed whether you're buying or selling start your journey at rvpostings.com it is time to check the level of our tanks and those are always sponsored by our friends at liquefied rv toilet treatment the no bs toilet treatment you can find liquefied over at liquefiedrv.com or on amazon j what is filling up your black tank this week? My black tank this week is, is full of West Nile virus. Um, oh, gross. Okay, well, I'm, sorry, you're laughing, but I, this is, I, I, you didn't know that I was going to have a downer of a black tank here. Uh, this is a uh, real downer. So, I, you know, I did a story uh, on the most deadly animal in Colorado in the last news video, which is mosquitoes. Uh, over, over 2023, 53 people died from West Nile virus. And... A couple people commented in in on that video some really uh, sad. some really sad moving stories about friends and family they lost to West Nile virus and folks I this is just a this is just a PSA here um, to take it seriously and use bug spray if if you can you know some people can't for certain reasons. Uh, there are some natural bug sprays that you can use. Um, just you know, learn about what you can use on children and all that. Um, but but bug spray uh, cover up cover up uh, both both West Nile virus, which there's no cure for, um, and and Lyme disease are just frightening things, right? Uh, and I think uh, it the trade off of using bug spray for me is is well worth it. Um, and, and I think it's something that you should consider uh, as well, because uh, again, no cure. So, um, so really think about about that and and try to avoid mosquitoes as, as much as possible, right? You know, be out, uh, be don't be outside when they're outside as much, which is you know dawn and and dusk, and and cover your body with with clothing. You know, when it's hot like this, actually, when it's over body temperature, <laughs> uh, sometimes actually. Uh, Look, wearing pants is is cooler than wearing shorts, uh, because you're insulating actually a cooler temperature inside you. Believe it or not, um, but anyway, be be cautious about mosquitoes as as much as possible because uh, West Nile is dangerous. All right, what is in your fresh tank this uh, week? My fresh tank uh, comes from the folks. At, I I have to open this up because it's press release from uh, the folks at Valerium uh, brand, which is a an aftermarket supplier for RVs. They have come up with this thing called the velocity switch for uh, for uh, arm awnings. You have to have like a vertical arm awning. Um, so when you fold it up, the arms are vertical, not the kind where the awning arms are horizontal at the top that that maybe like a lot of class B camper vans have. But this this is a replacement switch for your awning. So you you just uh, can upgrade the switch for your awning. And what it does is it sends your awning out and brings it back in twice as fast. And it's it's able to do the, the whole reason your awning goes in as slow as it does is so it doesn't damage the motor. And whatever technology they've put in here protects it from that. So I think that's really cool because sometimes it takes forever to bring those darn things in, especially if you have several of them. And also, you know, especially if it's really super windy and it catches you it's off guard, you're like, I yeah. need to get this in ASAP. And it's like, yeah, it's like it's like the sloth in Zootopia. And it's just like slowly moving in. And you're just like, oh, my God, go faster. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. What's in your black tank this week? Uh, so my black tank goes to an I, I didn't know this was a thing until I was about this many years old when I learned this, um, that 
people regularly or people I saw this at the campground uh someone was walking around their campsite spraying pesticide all around their campsite that they had just showed up at and look I understand nobody likes bugs nobody wants ants in their rig you know all of that I get it but please do not spray pesticide around your campsite. That is, it's, it blows my mind. And, and you, so you brought that. this up to me. So you, I, you, well, I, I, yeah, you I, saw it happening, and you're I like, called you. What are they doing? And, and, I said, and but I have seen this on lots of social media posts. Other people saying they've seen people do it. Other people uh, recommending it. This is not a thing. Well, I, I called you because I thought there's no way I'm seeing what I'm seeing right yeah, now. This yeah, can't yeah. be what I think it is. There must be some other explanation. There must be something going on that RVers do around the campsite that I just don't know about. No, that is exactly what this person was doing. It is, first off, it's not your campsite. Please do not make the decision for the owners of the RV park, how they go about treating the land here, the grounds here. Also, it's very, it could be potentially dangerous for the next person that comes into their pets, that their site. children. Um, Please do not do that. I, I was, it, people do it in, people do it in state and national parks. I am. Not that that, I, I, I don't want to sound like it's not bad to do it at a private RV resort, but like in a national park, you could probably go to jail for that. Yeah, it's not illegal here. But I think that you need to let the people who care for the grounds care for the grounds. And if you have a concern about your site, maybe you feel like there's too many ants around or something, go and speak to them about that. See if they have something that they do to take care of that. Do not take it upon yourself to spray the entire perimeter, not just where maybe you see the anthills. This person sprayed the entire perimeter and then some for quite sometime. And I just would like to encourage you that if that's a practice you've been doing, please consider others who are coming there after you. And please, if you feel that you have to do that, please go talk to the campground first. I guarantee, I can almost guarantee you they're going to ask you not to do that. And they're going to have very valid reasons why. So uh, again, just please don't spray around your campsite. No, Thank you. I'm, okay. Any anyone's private property? Can you imagine? I, I know it's like if someone came over and was going to hang out at your house for the night, out on your backyard, and they show up with their pesticide, and then they just walk the perimeter yeah, you of your that? of your porch, and just spray it down. And they're like, "What? I'm I'm here for the evening. It's, as long as I'm here, it's it's my space. And then when I leave, it ceases to be my space. But for right now, it's mine." Wow. Yeah, it's right. crazy. What's in your fresh tank? Uh, my fresh tank. Uh. I think I've talked a little bit about this, but I just really want to like fresh tank it is I've been really, really impressed with I needed to run into town yesterday and get some groceries. And, you know, in the past, we've talked about doing the Walmart pickup order and how great that's been. I have to tell you that Target has taken that to the next level. If you are not using Target pickup, I highly recommend you give it a look over the Walmart pickup, especially if you can find those super targets, which are now full on grocery stores. A lot of people don't consider buying groceries at Target, but it's... Target is, I mean, this one that I was at it in Hilton Head is a full on grocery store. And here's why I prefer it now over a Walmart pickup. So in the past, Walmart pickups, you have to select a time. Often it's not going to be same day. Sometimes it can be same day, but often it's not going to be. You have to select a time and you have to select a window. At the Target pickup now, I put it in order at about, oh, I would say three o'clock that day. That order And it was a a large order. There were 40 items in that order. The order was ready for me to pick up at 5 o'clock. It's usually two hours is what they say. Your order will be ready within two hours. But I can come and I can come at any time once the order is ready. I don't have to immediately leave. I don't have to immediately go get it. There's also no minimum. Walmart used to be a $35 minimum. I haven't used it in the last few months. Perhaps they've changed that to compete with Target now. There's no minimum. 
So if I just needed some toilet paper and a gallon of milk, I could place that order and they'll, yeah. they'll, they'll fill it for me and they'll bring it right out to my car. So and a lot of people worry about their like cold stuff too. It, 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 they put it in freezers and refrigerators it, until you're there. And let us, let us not forget the genius now of when you tell them that you're on your way, they also say, can we get you a Starbucks? <laughs> Would you like Starbucks? Yeah. And they'll, you can place a Starbucks order. And they will the, also bring that to your the, car. <laughs> the, the pickups are the way to go. I mean, they they just bring it to you. You, you know, sit where you're sitting. You pop the trunk. You, they put it in. You don't have to do anything. I think their prices are really uh, comparable to Walmart. On top of the fact, if you have the red card debit, which is just a basic debit card, you don't have to get the credit card. You can just have it linked right to your checking account. You get an additional 5% off. They have the Target Circle as well, which is also offers a bunch of discounts on food, coupons. You know, if you spend X amount, you know, a lot of times when I will go and get our household products and I'll just do all of our household products in, in one big ship, I kind of have it on a rotation at the house of when I know everything's going to come up and need to be reordered. Oftentimes they're like, if you spend 50, you get a $10 gift card. It's, I know it's not actually getting 20% off, but it's 20% back into a gift card into your target account for the next time then that I need household toiletries. Now I have 10 more dollars to take off and right. I can spend there. So I really think it's a, if you've only been exclusively looking at Walmart, I would encourage you to give Target a look, especially if you are traveling somewhere and you realize last minute that you're out of things, you can place that order while you're driving and then just get to the campground and then go over and get it. It'll be ready. You don't have to wait till the following morning. All right, that's it for this week's episode of the RV Miles Podcast. Yes, it is. And hey, just a reminder, Homecoming is coming up October 9th through the 13th in Amana, Iowa. If you have not bought your ticket, what are you waiting for? You want to come to this event. We have so many fun things happening. We've got trivia. We're going to be doing a bags tournament. We've got seminars, not only from Jason and I, but from other Mile Marker and RV Miles community members who are going to share their knowledge with all of us, rvmiles.com slash homecoming to pick up your tickets and we look forward to seeing you then but until next week actually not until next week we'll see you in a couple of weeks so please stay safe come back and listen to that detour episode next week and keep logging those rv miles bye everybody bye